Tonight, on assignment, a year on from the one-child policy in China coming to an end, Debbie Edward hears how its demise has caused both happiness and heartache for a generation of families. With Donald Trump heading to the White House, Emma Murphy examines one of the biggest challenges facing America, its failing health care system. My teeth are crumbling, I can't chew on them. This is caused from my teeth abscessing to the outside. Hello, Rachel. And Rachel Younger is in the Belgian city of Real, which has a unique and compassionate way of caring for those with mental health problems. You want to help somebody. She has no family. You want to give a home to those people. Good evening and welcome to On Assignment. For over 35 years, many Chinese families were punished if they had more than one child. But the law had unforeseen consequences. And so last year, the government ended the controversial policy, allowing parents for the first time in a generation to have a second baby. Joy for some. But as Debbie Edward found out, the one-child policy has also left deep scars. A warning, this film contains graphic and distressing scenes. China's rise to global superpower has been rapid and unrelenting. In Beijing, its shiny new skyscrapers dominate the landscape, dwarfing symbols of its imperial past. But in this strict communist state, economic success has come at a great cost to its people. These babies are the first in a new generation of Chinese siblings. The government having last year ended its one-child policy to tackle an acutely aging population and address a growing gender imbalance created by a preference for sons. The state now allows couples to have a second child. Second-time mothers are a new phenomena at maternity groups like this one. Women who grew up knowing their birthrights would be restricted. Their blossoming baby bumps celebrate government-granted permission to have a second child. Because我们都是独生子女的一代,在我们的成长过程中都没有兄弟姐妹的陪伴 38-year-old Li Jianli has an older brother, so always wanted to have more than one child. She, like many of the women she teaches, immediately embraced the change in government policy. The one-child policy was introduced in 1980, at the end of the Cultural Revolution, when China was home to a quarter of the world's population. President Deng Xiaoping's government instigated it as a means of improving living standards and driving economic development. It's estimated the policy prevented 400 million births. And while the population growth slowed, productivity soared. The country transformed from one of the poorest in the world to an economic powerhouse. The policy was most strictly enforced in big cities like Beijing, where brothers and sisters became something children just read about in books. 
But behind the trappings of China's prospering society lies a generation of heartache. Yang Zhongling was forced to abort her baby at nine months. Her husband had a son from a previous marriage, so the authorities deemed it an illegal second child. All of these parents lost their one child. In Chinese society, children are expected to look after you in old age. They have recently come together to launch a petition calling on the government to give them more support. Sun Ping's son died at the age of 20 from leukemia. They say the policy took away their basic human right to reproduce. Jia Ruxian's daughter committed suicide three years ago, age 24. <laughs> The government has never responded to criticisms about the policy. During the three decades of the one-child policy, millions of Chinese women had forced abortions. In a lockup on the outskirts of Beijing, I went to meet artist Wang Pong. He has collected the fetuses from terminated pregnancies. They range from five months to nine months. They were given to him by friends who wanted to show the world how cruel the policy could be. He has been threatened by the police several times and told to destroy them, but he continues to preserve evidence of what he says was murder. Having created such a legacy of fear and control around giving birth, it's proving hard to reintroduce many Chinese couples to the idea of having a second child. It's five o'clock on Friday evening, and 10-year-old Tian An is at her art class. It's one of many extracurricular activities her parents pay for. They are the conventional Chinese family the policy created. Mum, dad, and one child, who is the focus of all their attention, time, and money. Tian An doesn't want a brother or sister. At the Southern Maternity Unit, Li Jianli is recovering after giving birth to her second daughter. And we were invited along to meet her. <laughs> Nobody is more delighted than big sister Hannah. 
there's now nothing she likes more than holding baby Anna. <laughs> These children may never know of the scars left by the one child policy. They sing of marching towards a bright future one in which birth control is no longer used as a government strategy. Debbie Edward in Beijing. Every year, thousands of Americans die because they are unable to afford health insurance. President Obama tried to fix the problem, but his efforts have struggled to help the millions who can't afford even the most basic medical checks. As he prepares to leave the White House and make way for Donald Trump, Emma Murphy has been to one of the poorest counties in Virginia to find out more. It's four o'clock in the morning, and they've queued through the night. The poor and the pained, desperate for medical, dental, or eye care. It's a pitiful mass of society's most vulnerable. And yet this is not the developing world, nor some failed state. It is one of the world's most advanced nations. These are those America does not care for. I'm here because I'm an American who can't have insurance to cover the things that I need. We've been here since uh, about 8.30, and I'm here for eye exams. My teeth are crumbling. I can't chew on them. This is caused from my teeth abscessing to the outside. In the United States, there is very little government provision of dental or vision care and limited health care unless you can afford to pay for it. Thank you for waiting, and we really appreciate your waiting. You're all going to have some great services today. So we're going to let in the first group of patients. Number one, go ahead on in. Okay. Number two. As a result, the impoverished people here in this remote corner of Virginia are forced to turn to a charity for help. You need to get triage. Get triage right? The charity is Remote Area Medical, or RAM. They turn airports, stadiums and schools all over the country into pop-up clinics. Staffed by hundreds of volunteers and funded by millions of donated dollars. Most of their work is treating vision and dental problems, but they also provide vital medical care to those who have no other options. RAM was started not by an American, but by a Brit. Stan Brock worked in South America on ranches and later as a fearless wildlife television host. Occasionally, occasionally in life, one runs into a spot of bother. His experience working in some of the most inaccessible places in the world inspired him to turn his back on fame and fortune and dedicate his life bringing medical aid to those who need it most. When I founded this organization, it was basically to provide care in the remotest regions of the world. Uh, but then we got bogged down here in the United States with the incredible demand here. I'd like to achieve uh, our objective uh, so that we were no longer needed here. But there's no end of that in sight. The demand for what RAM offers is greater now than at any point in its history. Last year, in clinics like this across the country, they treated 28 thousand people. Let me see the top. Jessica is 30 years old. A young woman about to have all her teeth extracted. Like many here, poverty, a lack of affordable dental care and lifestyle means that her teeth are sadly beyond saving. Not only is it a travesty, it's a, uh, it's a disaster. Several years ago, uh, there was a 10 or 11-year-old child in, Mer in the state of Maryland. He had an abscessed tooth. 
and his mother could not find a dentist to take care of it. Uh, the child died. And people die in this country from, uh, from dental disease. Clinics like these are literally saving lives. Over the course of this weekend alone, over a thousand teeth were extracted. What did they do? Three teeth? Yeah. Wow. Well, good luck. Yeah. See ya. This weekend's clinic is being held in the tiny Virginian town of Pennington Gap. Here, a quarter of the population live below the poverty line. At the local Methodist church, volunteers make meals for the hungry. Over a lesson on how to make the cheap staple cornbread, one of the volunteers, Nancy Hobbs, tells me why RAM is so crucial to this area. Well, the economy has tanked. There is, there's not much employment. Most people don't have insurance. Or if they have insurance, it's, it's inadequate. Um, we, we no longer have a hospital in the county, so there's that increased need. We've grown up in an area where there are a lot of haves and have-nots. And that's why RAM is why that's so important. Oh, you're getting it now. <laughs> <laughs> Dakota Martin brings four generations of his family for the meal, and all will be going to the RAM clinic later. My blood pressure is really high, and I need to get checked out because I bid, it's been so high that when I get real dizzy and I feel like I'm going to pass out. My doctor at the time, she said that uh, it looked I didn't have a heart attack or stroke on top of it. She asked me how I was walking. I said, what do you mean? She said, uh, how did you, uh, you come in here without having a stroke or a heart attack? She said, you should be dead right now. So it's going to ask you questions, okay? Oh. All right, did you have a stroke? At the clinic, Dakota is among the first to be treated. It sounds like you're a little short of breath. Yeah. How, how long you had that? Uh, all right. I've had it for like a year or two. As an adult, he no longer qualifies for the state-funded Medicaid, and health care insurance is well beyond his means. It's estimated that every year 26,000 adults die in America because of a lack of health insurance. President Obama has attempted to change this. The Affordable Care Act, dubbed Obamacare, aimed to give Americans access to cheaper health care. The volunteers I spoke to at the clinic think Obama's plan has fallen short because the premiums are still often too high even for those in work. There's a kind of a window in there that if you don't make enough money, you don't qualify for Obamacare. Okay? If you make too much money, your premiums are too high for, uh, for Obamacare. So there, there's, there's only a segment of the population that is even being covered. It's very depressing, um, the state of these people. I mean, people coming in with makeshift uh, oxygen tanks and uh, makeshift uh, wheelchairs and uh, children and adults. I mean, I talk to these people up there in Washington about the problems that we face. Um, it's not my place uh, uh, to tell them, you know, uh, how to do it. But hey, fix the dental, fix the vision, uh, and fix these problems for the poor. Whatever the criticisms, an estimated 20 million more Americans have access to health care insurance thanks to Obamacare. But now President-elect Trump and the Republicans have vowed to repeal and replace some elements of the law. The scale of poverty in America, combined with a system that excludes many from treatment, has created generations of chronic illness. And the new administration is yet to give full details on how it proposes to combat this. Until they decide, it seems the desperate need for Ram's work is likely to continue. Emma Murphy in Virginia. For 700 years in the city of Gheal in Belgium, St. Dimpna, the patron saint of the mentally ill, has been inspiring the residents to take responsibility for the most vulnerable in society. 
Rachel Younger has been to visit the city to meet some of the families trying to keep this legacy alive and learn more about how this unique tradition has endured. Inside St. Dimpner's Church in Hjell, the children's choir sing about caring for people wherever you find them. And since the Middle Ages, that's exactly what this pioneering city has done. To find out how it became a rather unconventional refuge for people with mental health problems, you only need look up. Woven into the windows is the story of the town's patron saint, Dimpner, whose father killed her after the death of her mother sent him mad with grief. Since then, others whose lives have been touched by mental illness have come here asking Dimpner to heal them. When the pilgrims could no longer fit inside the church, local families took them in as boarders, a tradition of fostering that has passed down the generations for centuries. I've come to meet one of the many women in the city named after its patron saint. Welcome. Hey, Dimpna. Hello. As a child, Dimpna grew up with boarders, and she and her husband, Franz, want to introduce me to Maurice, who's been a guest in Hjell for as long as he can remember, and a part of Dimpna's family for decades. I was not going to be 10 years old when I came so this Morris is echt uit een arm gezin gekomen. Die mensen hadden niks en die had geen eten of zoiets. Eh? So, uh, so how long have you known Maurice? Uh, 23 jaar. Want hij is 10 jaar bij mijn moeder, bij mijn ouders geweest. En dan is hij van mijn ouders naar ons gekomen. En wij hebben altijd, in mijn familie is altijd pleegzin geweest. Zowel bij mijn onkels als tantes als bij mijn grootouders. The element of trust here is extraordinary. Dimpner and Franz have never been told what Maurice's diagnosis is, only that he should be treated like any other member of the family. So he takes his turn with the housework and cares for their animals. Mm -hmm. That's a manneke. Oh. And this one? That's a And what does he eat? What do you feed him? He eats corals and some fruit. You want him back? Right. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> it's wriggly. <laughs> Maurice, what does it mean to, to have your own family? It's not always easy living at such close quarters. Yet none of the families get more than a small daily payment for taking in someone whose past they know nothing about. The decision on whether or not a psychiatric patient can live with a family now falls to clinicians at the city's mental health centre, which took over charge of the borders from the church in the 19th century. The family care system couldn't work if it wasn't for the amount of support that's provided by the hospital. It carefully assesses every patient before they're placed with a family. And then the boarders get regular visits from social services and the families themselves, well, they've always got a nurse or a doctor on the end of the phone if they need somebody to talk to. All of that is really expensive. And it's the Belgian government that picks up the bill. I went to meet one of the coordinators to find out why the state keeps paying for a system that is, after all, 700 years old. People with, with uh, mental, mental diseases very often are discon disconnected with society. Uh, when, when you have a psychiatric illness, very often a whole lot of connections um, no longer uh, can exist. And I think that our system can connect people again, can give them a new identity. It's a simple philosophy that's been studied and applauded by doctors who visit the city from all over the world. Bert tells me it works not despite the family's lack of medical knowledge, but because of it. A foster family is therapeutic, not because it's a family of therapists. Imagine that you have to live in a family with therapists. No, it's, it's therapeutic because it's a family. 
It's, it's normal life. But it's not just a family affair. The whole city plays its part. Walking around here, what really strikes you is that if people look a little different or are acting a little differently, nobody gives them so much as a second glance because they belong here. And everybody from the market stall holders to bus drivers and bartenders accept them. It's just the way it's always been here. And that makes a real difference to boarders like Tanya, who seems to know everyone. <laughs> It turns out compassion like this is contagious. Tanya lives with Roger and Vivian. They came to Hiao knowing nothing about its history, but after meeting neighbors who had taken in borders, quickly decided they wanted to help. <laughs> If they hadn't, Tanya and her irrepressible sense of humour would still be contained inside an institution. They've invited me to dinner to get to know all three of them better. The rabbit? <laughs> <laughs> and then she's it. Oh, with what? With what? With what? You're not from here, and yet no. it was still something you wanted to do. You want to help somebody. She has no family. She has a family, but uh, something happens. So you, you want to give a home to those people. So Tanya, what is it like living here? Heel fijn en het is hier heel rustig. En de mensen zijn hier heel vriendelijk hier in straat. Vivian has cancer. And the couple have already raised three children. You might think this should be their time. But that's not how they see it. I think for us, she's almost our daughter. We have always for everyone cared. And we can go further. If I had a home with 24 rooms, I would take 24 people in it. <laughs> There was a time when 3,000 people, one in five of the city's population, was a border. But Hiel is changing. And now Tanya is one of just 200 guests left. Roger worries constantly about what will happen to her, to the whole system, when his generation's gone. If I ask my children if they want to take over, they wouldn't, because they don't have time. They have to work. These days, you have to work with two people, the man and the woman, to pay their houses. And that's what, uh, what's make it so difficult. Does that mean you worry about Tanya's future? Yes, of course. Yeah. Where does she have to go? It's sobering, isn't it, that the very things the World Health Organization believes are contributing to a decline in our mental health, things like the long hours we work and the stress of increasingly fractured lives, they're the same pressures that are undermining a way of caring that's lasted for centuries here. But whilst it endures, it offers an alternative for some of the most vulnerable people amongst us, as relevant today as it ever was. Rachel Younger in Gheal. That's all for tonight and indeed for 2016. The new series of On Assignment will be back, however, in the spring when I hope you'll join us. Until then, from all of us, good night and thank you for watching.